the Old Vic Theater in Chicago, HBO presents One Night Stand. Ladies and gentlemen, here he is, the star of our show, Bobby Slayton. I love this. I have never played an alley. I'm like the Jack the Ripper of comedy. I think that's great. You know what's terrific? You know, I'm glad that HBO decided to do use Chicago to do these shows. Now, I got here two days ago. It's a great story. I fly here from Miami, 85 degrees in Miami Beach. And I'm on a plane, and they give me the Chicago trip, and I'm looking at the weather page, and I see the high is 15 degrees. Now, you know, I mean, I'm glad you people are so optimistic about life, but I don't care how you look at it. 15 is not a high. It ought to be like a low and a really fucking low. Don't even think about going out. Yeah, honey, it's gonna be a high. It's gonna get up to 15. It could drop to 10. You might have to take a sweater. Ooh. So anyway, get a load of this. So two days ago, I'm in Miami doing an anti-drug benefit. Now, when I was in high school, I did a lot of drugs because drugs were okay when I was a kid. All right? They're not okay now. I know a lot of people are home watching on TV, and I'm not saying the drugs are okay, especially for the teens out there. But when I was a teen in the 60s, we had good drugs. All right? You know, we didn't have... Well, there was no such thing as crack. You know, when I was a kid, a crack salesman just meant the guy was really good at what he did. But, you know, we smoked pot, we took LSD, and yeah, once in a while some schmuck would jump out of a window. But for every guy that jumped out of a window, 300 of us saw God, all right? So, you know, you're gonna have that kind of trade-off with any recreation. You know, you go skiing, a thousand people have a great day on the slope, some schmuck gets caught in an avalanche, all right? Now, again, I'm saying, I'm not saying drugs are okay, although, if you look at Keith Richards, this man is the greatest living testimonial to drug abuse on the face of the earth. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, this guy is almost 50. He's making a lot of money, he's getting laid a lot, and he's playing rock and roll for two and a half hours every night. When my father was 50, this old fart couldn't get out of the bathtub without his testicles dragging on the tile. Like a tailpipe from an old Ford Escort with the spark shooting out. So anyway, I'm in Miami and I'm doing this anti-drug show and it's put on by some Jewish women's group. So instead of a crowd like yourself, it's all these old Jewish broads with the eyebrows shaved off and drawn back in like Klingons. You know that look? You know, eyebrows up the head like some kind of Romulan in drag with eight inches of metallic blue eyeshadow like tropical fish. And they're all sitting out there. And the group is actually Jewish women against drugs. Oh, the best part. Their campaign slogan was, just say, nah, nah, nah. Now, once again, I don't mean to make fun of the drug problem, because I realize there's a big problem in this country, and I understand why they have all these anti-drug commercials on TV late at night aimed towards the teens of America, although I don't get the point of half of them, like the thing with the frying pan and the egg. What is that all about? This is your brain. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? Yeah, do I get bacon with this? Do I get a piece of toast? What is the point? What are you trying to tell me? Now, I'm waiting to fly out of Florida to come here to Chicago. Now, as you people know, O'Hare Airport here, next to Atlanta, is one of the busiest airports in the country. They're, they're applauding like you're proud of this. Uh. So I waited to fly out of Florida. Now, you know before you get on a plane, how they make those announcements, any old people, any handicapped people, get on the plane first. Fine. But in Miami, they just should have said, everybody but you, Bobby. Everybody, everybody but Bobby. Everybody get on the plane but Bobby. And all these elderly Jews, it takes them an hour to get on the plane, because it's like they have magnets in their shoes when they walk. <laughs> it's these kosher hush puppies. They only come in the color white. You know, it's like they bought the shoes at Kmart and they forgot to cut that little plastic thing holding them together. You know, I'll tell you something. I fly every week of my life, and I've never flown first class. I have no idea what they do up there. You can't even see up there. You can't even look up there, because they got that curtain. What are these special people? What, what is with the curtain? What are they voting? What are they trying on pants? Why can't I look up there? You ever get the feeling that if your plane ever goes down, first class is just gonna break off and keep on going? Psh, see you later, boat people. We're going to Hawaii. We'll talk to you later. Now, get a load of this. So we're flying here, and somewhere, I don't know where the hell we were, but somewhere, we're in the sky, somewhere. 
and we hit an air pocket. This has never happened to me before, and I hope it never happens to anybody in this room. We hit this turbulent air pocket where the oxygen masks fell from the overhead compartment. Now, I never understood this whole oxygen mask idea. I mean, if God forbid your plane is plummeting towards Earth at 500 miles an hour, the last thing I want is oxygen. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be sitting there, oh, honey, wake up, we're gonna be dead in a second. Wake up, this is great. Wake up, breathe, look out the window, the trees are getting big. You know why? Because we're gonna be dead. Uh, wake up, you awake, you alive, we're gonna be dead. 10 seconds, let's count down. My plane's going down, I want a pound of cocaine and a big fat black hooker falling on my face. Something that's gonna kill me in five seconds. God, my wife, who's not here tonight, hates that joke. She goes, I hope you're not gonna do that hooker joke on TV. Because she's always saying to me, would you rather have, a, if it's your last minute on earth, would you rather have a big hooker than me? Well, not under normal circumstances, but it's my last minute on earth, yeah. Because that's the way guys think, and I want you women to understand that, you know? Because a lot of comics talk about the difference between men and women, and what it all comes down to is that men, if they're not thinking like little kids, they're thinking with their penises, and that's the way guys think. You know, guys, you'll never figure out how women think. You can watch Phil Donahue and Oprah Winfrey and all these other feminist Nazi programs from today till tomorrow, <laughs> telling you what scumbags we are, and forget it, you'll never figure it out. You know, you're always making mistakes, you're always screwing up, you know, you're always apologizing for something or other, and that's why they invented flower stores. It wasn't Mother's Day or Valentine's Day. It was the other 363 screw-up days of the year. So you know what it basically comes down to? I'll tell you right now. I think for the most part, women are always accusing guys of not being romantic. And it's not that we're not romantic. Yeah, see, it's true. Oh, we'll break over those study groups and discuss this now. Let me tell you what it is there, sweetheart. And believe me, I'd love to sit and chat with you, but you might not have noticed I'm a little busy right now. What it comes down to is that it's not that men aren't romantic, it's just that our idea of romance, women, and your idea of romance are two totally different things. Like to me, and to most guys in this room, a perfectly romantic night. You stay home, you get a pizza, you rent Robocop. <laughs> women don't understand or appreciate that. Women like to do things that guys don't really care for, like making candlelight dinners. You know, we try to get into it, but a candlelight dinner after like a minute, I can't see the goddamn potato. This sucks, where's my fork? I can't see a fucking thing. Put the TV on, get some light in here. That's all. That's all it comes down to. You know, it's like taking a shower together. Yeah, of course, women, you love it, because you're the ones under the hot water. We're the ones with a shriveled up penis and soap in our eyes. Honey, I'll be over here. Let me know when you need me. Yeah, this is great. I don't know where my dick is. It's somewhere inside my intestines. I got shampoo in my eyes. I love this. This is great. <laughs> Taking a shower together. It's one of those things that sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun until you do it. Looks good on paper. Sounds like a great idea when you get it. You know, it's like eating pancakes. You ever get this bug up your ass about once a year? Hey, I haven't had pancakes in a long time. They look good on the menu, somebody else has them, and then you get them, and they're these doughy, cholesterol-filled sacks of crap. They suck. <laughs> you take two bites, and you pick it off everybody else's plate, wait until lunchtime. <laughs> Only more disgusting than pancakes are waffles. These are like stale pancakes in the shape of a brick. Brilliant concept. <laughs> I'll give you a better example of what I'm talking about. This summer, for some reason, my wife and I are driving around, and we, there's a miniature golf course. And my wife goes, you know, I haven't played since I was a kid. And I go, me neither. And I don't want to play, because it's a stupid game. <laughs> but she talks me into it, and we go to play miniature golf, and I see why I never play this, because it's so moronic. You know, we get stuck behind some third world family from Budapest with laundry on their head. <laughs> They've got 12 kids who have no concept of the game. They're trying to eat the ball. <laughs> One of the kids is like retarded. He's got his hand caught in the windmill. I Another family's living in the fucking windmill. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, honey, this is great. We'll play another round of miniature golf. We'll go home. We'll have a pancake, candlelight dinner. We'll take a shower together. It'll be a goddamn dream fucking weekend. Anyway, what it basically comes down to here, and again, this is nobody's fault. According to every expert, and I'm sure you've heard this before, they say that men reach their sexual peak at around 17. And women reach it in their 30s. See, right now, they're reaching it right now as we speak. 
Now let's examine this problem, guys. I mean, think back to when you were 17. You had no job, you had no car, you had no money, you had no apartment. Equals no pussy. You're 17, you're a dork, you're not getting laid. You have the body of a man and the mind of a child. So even if you're lucky enough to meet a woman, you don't know what to do. I'm 17, uh, I, I got a girl, I'll buy a condom, and then I'll make a water balloon and throw it at her head. Ah! <laughs> and the fact that women reach their sexual peak in their 30s, it's not right and it's not fair. Because I'm in my 30s and I love sex. It's just first, I want to see what's on cable. <laughs> and you married guys know what I'm talking about. If you're married, you can buff the wife anytime you want. You're paying 10 bucks a month for HBO, you want to watch Predator. <laughs> and again, marriage is a great institution. I don't mean to make fun of it because my wife doesn't like it. I'm married, I love my wife, I'll say that on record. Although I'll tell you something right now. You know well, you know as well as I do, the marriage had to be a woman's idea. And some schmuck fell for this hook, line, and sinker. You know, many, many, many years ago, some guy was sitting there going, all right, let me get this straight. So what are you saying, sweetheart? I can never sleep with anybody else ever again for the rest of my life. And then if things don't work out, you get all my stuff. <laughs> Great, let's go with that concept. Let's run with that. I like that. And let me tell you something right now, all right? And I don't say any of this to be sexist, but basically, men and women are different. Like I said earlier, men think with their dicks. Women don't have dicks, and they don't want dicks. I've never, you know, that, that amateur psychologist crap, that women want to be like men, they really want penises. I know they don't want them, and you women know you don't want them. And they certainly don't want testicles. Because you know no woman in her right mind is going to ever carry around a bag that she can't put stuff in. You guys know what I'm talking about. You ever have a fight with your wife, an argument with your girlfriend? What do you do, boys? You storm out of the room. <laughs> and they know you're pissed, but they're gonna chase after you. Did you hear me? Did you hear what I said? Yes, I did. <laughs> now that's great. You've trained him to put the toilet seat back down. But look at it from our point of view, girls. All right? Now let's say you train your boyfriend, your husband, he's very well. Does he get a biscuit when he puts it back down? Yes, he does. All right. A guy wakes up three o'clock in the morning, he's gotta take a leak. Now let's just say the toilet seat is in the pussy whip position. <laughs> now three o'clock in the morning, you know guys aren't turning on any lights. You know, we're pretty much in that bathroom peeing by braille. <laughs> guys just wake up and piss all over the place until we hear water and then we try to center it. He's making a pretty big mess at three o'clock, girls. You get up to take a leak at four o'clock, guess who's sitting in it? <laughs> you know, I'll tell you something too, when I realize that women have a lot of things to deal with in life that men don't think about, and I understand that, and I don't mean to make fun of it, but guys, we have to deal with crap too. A guy wakes up in the morning with a heart on, and women, you know they're better than anybody because you're the ones that feel it in your back. <laughs> First thing in the morning, you don't know what this guy wants, your purse or your pussy. Oh, don't hurt me, just take what you want. Ow, 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 ow it's just you. Oh. <laughs> Guys wake up in the morning with a heart on, we gotta take a leak, we can't even stand in the bathroom. We have to stand in the hallway, try to meet the toilet as the heart on goes away. Shit, the black guy's gotta use the neighbor's hallway. Hey, hey, I gotta pee, let me in. He's gotta come around the corner, back in off walls. See, I knew the black guys would be laughing at that. You make fun of their big dicks, they never get pissed. You'll never see a black guy stand up. Hey, that's racist. I'm hung like a Mormon. Yeah. <laughs> but black people, you make up names. It's like you could be making love in the backseat of a Toyota. We named the kid uh, Tercel. Tercel, that's a good name. I mean, it's true, and I don't say that to be mean, but you know, it's like a black woman could come back from a clinic, decide to name a little girl Gonoria. Hey, Gonoria, hey, Sophilis, what's happening? Hey, Chlamydia, bulimia, hemophilia. <laughs> you know where I came up with that bit? Before I was even a comic. 
I worked with all these great black women in New York in the mailroom of IBM. Actually, it wasn't IBM, it was the black division, WeBM. And uh, <laughs> that had some really cool names. But we named our little girl Natasha. I promised her mother I'd mention her name on TV. You know what's amazing is that my daughter, you know, she wasn't planned. We just had her. I'm glad she's here, but she wasn't planned. And the thing, the reason I think we had a kid was basically, besides the fact that I fucked my wife, was basically <laughs> that had something to do with it, I think. Coincidence? Perhaps. You know, my wife, when I met her, was on the pill, and she stopped taking the pill because she thought it might be messing up her body. Now, women, if you're on the pill, it may be okay and it might not be okay. You know, they say the pill's okay. It's like when they spray for med flies in California with that malathion crap. They make you cover up your cars because it can strip the paint off an automobile. But you can go outside and breathe it. No, it won't hurt you. <laughs> the baked down enamel off an automobile like a piranha rips the flesh off a cow. But go ahead and breathe it. It's okay. <laughs> But you know, they find that the melathion, Agent Orange, is no good for you. Even like small little things like, I guess, caffeine and saccharin are no good for you. And if caffeine's gonna kill you, who knows what the pill may be doing? Don't you think, ladies, if you're on the pill, you might wake up 30 years from now? Hey, honey, you ever see this breast on my back? <laughs> what is that, has that always been there? And what's the guy gonna say, shut up, turn around, don't go away? But I'll tell you something, though, it's tough, it's tough, and I, you know, it's tough raising a kid now. It's, you know, I wanted my wife and kid to come out here, but my baby wasn't feeling well. You know, it's interesting, too, I just gotta tell you this really quickly. She's got this little bit of a flu, and I really, you know, when you're, you, when you're a new dad and your kid's under a year old, you know, and they get sick, you think they're gonna die. And then when they get better, you wanna kill them, so you never win, you know? <laughs> So she's got this little bit of a flu and she got a really bad diaper rash from it, and your parents know about it, I guess, desitin, you put it on the diaper rash, and it hasn't been working. So we go to the doctor just before I came out here to Chicago and he recommends, he actually gave me a prescription for something for the baby, some kind of prescription tushy cream, all right? $30 for a little tube of tushy cream for the kid's crotch. Now you know what kills me about the FDA in this country? Why do you have to have prescription tushy cream? Is anybody abusing this stuff? I mean, are kids taking this out of their mother's medicine cabinet? Look, you rub this on your ass, man, it's great. Oh, you just need more and more. I got a monkey on my butt. It's unbelievable stuff. Yeah, a lot of Betty Ford rash cream tushy clinics popping up around the country now. <laughs> but I'm glad they didn't come out, because I just, you know, like I said, I was in Florida working and I came here and I would have had to take them. You know, and traveling with, you know, you guys think it's tough traveling with a woman? You ever go away for a weekend? Honey, put the refrigerator back, we live here. Just take a pair of underwear and a toothbrush like I am. We'll be back in two days, take my word for it. But you travel with a kid, you're like Patton. All right, let's move it out. Who's got the car seat? Who's got the diapers? Who's got the baby stroller? All right, we need like eight natives with boxes on their head. What 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 All right, men, United Flight 748, do the metal detector. What a, what a, what a. See, I guess since the beginning of time, men are always making fun of women. And I guess the old Catskills 50s attitude was the thing about women drivers, which as you all know, is a bunch of crap. Because women can drive as good or as bad as anybody else. All right? It's true. But I will tell you something. The idea of putting car phones in automobiles ain't gonna help that women's driver's myth at all. I mean, between that and the rear view mirror for putting on mascara, here's an accident waiting to happen. So, gee, Sally, I was driving along, Bloomingdale's having a sale. Bam, I just hit somebody else. I don't know, they said the light was red, I don't. Why don't you just let blind people drive with seeing eye dogs running alongside the car? I mean, drunk drivers are bad enough, but at least they're concentrating on the road. I mean, they might see eight of them, but at least, oh God, I'm drunk, I gotta see where I'm going here. At least give them an E for effort, you know? But you know what it comes down to, though? It's not women drivers. You know, when you travel around the country, I find no matter where I go, somebody's blaming somebody for the bad driving. Northern California, there's the Asian Chinese drivers. In Florida, it's the old Jews. In New York, they're yelling at the Pakistani cab drivers. And you know what it comes down to? There's just so many jerks on the road. It has nothing to do with size, race, religion, or anything like that. The problem is, gang, that it's too easy to get a driver's license in America. At 16 years old, you remember how easy it was, how thrilled you were to get a license? And all you do is you get in your car, and some goober with a clipboard gets in the car with you. And he watches you drive around the block, parallel park, and bingo zippy, you're on the highways of America waiting to kill people. You know, I mean, I think things in this country shouldn't work by how old you are, it should work by how smart you are. 16, you can drive. 18, you can vote. 21, you can drink. It's a crock of shit. 18, you can vote. It's your God-given right. Fuck that. If you're a moron, your IQ's under 100, you don't vote. That way people like Dan Quayle don't have jobs in the first place.
I mean, you're a pinhead, your IQ is under 100, you just worry about small fries, large fries, keep your trainee hat on, and stay out of the goddamn way. I'll make the decisions around here. And then at 21, you can drink, and I'll tell you what's bad about this, and I'm not saying that teenagers should be allowed to drink, because it is a problem. But at the same time, there's a lot of 30 and 40 year olds that should never be allowed in a bar, all right? It's a responsibility drinking. And I'm not just talking about drinking and driving, I'm talking about drinking, period. See, let's say it worked by IQ instead of ID. You went to a bar, you went to a nightclub, bouncer at the door, ask for your IQ card. Well, let's see here, your IQ is 40. Well, it is a country western bar, I guess you could come on in. There's a lot of morons out there, folks, and they've got to be stopped. You know, I know I got it, and I'll tell you something, too. I don't mean to sound like this right-wing, you know, Republican schmuck, but, you know, if you look at the death penalty, we got to start thinning out the herd, and murder might just be the only way to do it. <laughs> now, I know this pro-death penalty against it, you know, but let me tell you what it comes down to. In Texas, about a month ago, 60 Minutes did a big story on this guy in Texas who's going to get the electric chair. He's borderline psycho, borderline retarded. He's not like either one. It's like, sort of like a singer slash actress. Can't do either one really well. Kind of dabbles in both fields a little bit. So the guy's gonna get the electric chair and all these white guilty liberal douchebags around America are saying, you can't kill crazy people. They're crazy, they don't know what they did. Well, if they don't know what they did, then they don't know you're gonna kill them. Put the schmuck in the electric chair and tell him it's a fucking ride. Here you go, pal, Pirates of the Caribbean. Yo ho ho, here we go. And I don't mean to knock America, I love America. I'm proud to be American, although 20, 30 years from now, we're all gonna be proud to be Japanese. You know that, don't you? Because they're taking over this country really fast. And I'll tell you something too. If anybody, if we're gonna sell this country out to anybody, Better the Japanese than the Russians or the Iranians. Because Japan, you know, my wife, we went there a couple of years ago for a vacation. And the, J the Japanese really love America. You know, they, they carry around their Madonna records and they wear their designer guest jeans and their American Calvin Klein t-shirts. And they really like American pop culture. You know, that's why I've always been amazed. And maybe it's because I live in California where there's a lot of Asian people. The people mix up the Japanese and the Chinese. Because they don't look alike, they don't sound alike, they don't act alike. You know, for example, you know that stuff that went down in Tiananmen Square? you know, last year, and all the Chinese are out there all dressed like peasants, all looking exactly the same with the same haircuts. You know, that's what's amazing. There's a billion Chinese guys in the world, and they all have the same haircut. <laughs> you know, you ever go to a barber shop or a beauty salon, you know, where they have all the different hairdos on the wall? You think in a barber shop in China, they just have like 30 pictures of Mo? <laughs> yeah, I got a for you right here. We have a Mo. You have, you can get a Mo. M Mo. Mo. Mo? Okay, 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 here, Mo. <laughs> what are you driving me crazy? I, I, I'm busy here. Where are you, Mo? Mo? We are running out of haircut, Mo. We have uh, Mo, Mo. Ah, uh, right here, okay. Pete Rose. <laughs> Pete Rose. Yeah. But you guys have been really great tonight. I want to thank you for coming out here and watching these shows. and. And just remember something. When it comes to comedy, if you can't laugh at yourself, make fun of other people. Thanks, I'll see you later, good night. Thank you very much. You've got three shows tonight in Cleveland. Oh, leave me alone. I'm sick of traveling. I don't want to go to Cleveland again. You've got a family to support. 
maybe if you finished school, you would have a real job like your brother. You never listen to anyone. That's your problem, Mr. Comedian. Stop right in his face. 